Hello again, everyone. Michael Vosbein with Drummer Nation Live. Adam Nussbaum had a family issue today, so he had to beg off. I think he and his family will be fine, but we wish them the best, and I'll see him next time. Meanwhile, my scheduled guest is none other than the wonderful Paul Wordico. Hello, Paul. How are you, my friend? Hi, Michael. Good to see you. Hopefully, Adam's okay and his family's okay. Wish yeah, you the best. I, I think they're fine. Um, but um, it's been a while since I've seen you. You're you're from the Chicago area, and you still live up that way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, why move? You know. I mean, I've lived here my entire life, and uh, you know, family's here. Uh, my teaching job at Roosevelt University is here, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I can fly anywhere. And you well, know, and the way climate change is going right now, we've had a beautiful summer here. It's fantastic. Almost every day, it's been like you know, seventies, eighties. Oh, so wow. you know, perfect. Yeah. Well, um, looking at your bio, looking at your website, looking at all the things you've done, I, I mean, I hardly know where to start. Uh, how many Grammys do you have? Well, I've got seven, and you can see them in back. There you they can are. see that there's there are three different sizes. So it's interesting because, you know, um, I did a thing uh, for DW and, and this film Masters of Resonance a couple of years ago at the Grammy Museum in L.A., and they had a display with all five sizes of the Grammys. So I got three out of those five. But it's interesting how they kind of changed and then they've gotten bigger. So the four biggest ones are the ones that they're still at at this point. Well, congratulations. Uh, those are with what ensembles? It's all with Matheny, but for a lot of different things. I mean, even categories that don't exist anymore, like jazz fusion, and, mm -hmm. um, contemporary jazz. We won one for best rock instrumental. You know, so you'll take it. You'll take it. You'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you've been nominated for many more than that. I know with all kinds of projects. Yeah. Sure. And, and hopefully and, the new record. I want to get this new record um, that we're going to talk about. It would be great to even get mm -hmm. that uh, considered for the Grammys at this point. I haven't submitted it yet, but mm -hmm. for me, it's one of my best records. So I'd love to at least have it get out there. I've been listening to it. It's wonderful. We're going to get to it in a minute. How many albums do you have out on your own name? Well, if I look, I think I sent you my Wikipedia page because you did. I actually ended up um you know because you know the wikipedia page is always nice but sometimes it's just like what p other people might have written about you or whatever and i decided okay i'm gonna i'm gonna put up like a selected discography and there's like hundreds up there and i didn't even realize you know and mm -hmm. they're all they're all different which is is pretty crazy so under myself i guess i have if i look um one two three four five six seven eight nine i think i have nine under leader and as co-leader i've got another probably dozen or so that's great now let's talk about that as a drummer uh we mm -hmm. all begin our careers we're sidemen we're uh hired guns we do what we do and then eventually right. you want to move into that leader realm so what was that about for you well it's funny because um you're right. As a drummer, a lot of times if you're on a session, you know, you're you're hired gun and, and you're there to, you know, represent the music and make the artist and the producer and the engineer and the ranger happy. And then after a while, you know, people start using you for you and they value your opinion. So after a while, you start giving more feedback on, on arrangements you know, on the sound. So after a while, you know, you're a producer. I've produced a lot of records now, but it was just a natural process. So then as a leader, um, you know, I've always had leader tendencies, you know, because I just don't want to be a drummer. I mean, you know, because for me playing drums is being part of the ensemble. And when I'm playing in a band, I'm not just playing like, say, with the bass player, you know, I'm I'm referencing the melody and the harmony. And it's almost like lead drum sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I started, you know, figuring out my style. And then the first record I ever did as a leader, even though I had led gigs as a leader, um, someone, this guy, Mara Komar, who was the president of the Pat Metheny fan club in, in uh, Europe, he wanted to bring my trio over. 
And so I said, sure, you know, so I, I put, brought my tree over, John Mulder on guitar, Eric Kochberg on bass, and we did 11 days straight in Germany and in Poland. And it was a great tour, didn't think much of it, but I knew it was recorded at the last gig at the Aquarium Club in Warsaw. And so a couple of years later, you know, I, I just found the tape of it and I went, wow, this is really good. And I decided, that why not put this out? And um, I had, even though it was direct to Dat, the mastering guy uh, was Stevie Wonder's engineer. And he didn't believe it was live at first because the engineer that did it in Poland, he was in the basement while we were in the club upstairs. He couldn't even see what was going on. And he did this amazing job. So that was the start of that was my first record. That's that's so, sort of how this all happened. And then, you know, I'm really into arranging. And so a lot of times what I do, whether they're my tunes or, you know, someone else's tunes, I take them and then morph them into like what I think would be great in my band. Right. So for instance, uh, Eric Hogbert, the bass player, he's written some great tunes. And by the time I'm done with them, they're almost unrecognizable, you know, because <laughs> it might just be a straight ahead tune and I'm, I'm doing all kind of arrangement stuff with it and he loves it. And so for me, you know, when we're drummers, we're also conductors, you know, we're, we're in control of the tempo and the dynamics mm -hmm. and all that. And we're also arranging, you know, our parts, you should be able to turn off everybody else and just listen to a drum part and know exactly where you are in the song, because all great drum parts are compositional. They're not just usually just a, a beat or two beats or four beats repeated. And right. so es especially as, uh, in, in jazz music, which you, you played mostly uh, the it's not uh, repetitive. Yeah. It's not just pattern oriented, you know, it's mm -hmm. groove oriented, but I figured out even on this last record, I figured out what I do and we could talk about that later. But I, a lot of times, I mean, you know, I'm hired for everything. If you look at my discography, I'm on rock records, I'm on blues yeah, records, everything, all kinds of but, stuff. but if I play, quote unquote jazz i don't even like that term because i don't even know what jazz is anymore but mm -hmm. improvisational if i play improvisational music you know i'm referencing and i was listening to a new record i go wow i tie things it's a flow but it's a horizontal thing as opposed to a lot of things are vertical and, and beats mm -hmm. are usually vertical you know, they right. move sideways a lot of my stuff has got dynamic you know ebbs and flows and it's almost like water it's you know it's it's it does that and listening to some of this stuff on the new record i went wow that's what i do i tie everything together with mm -hmm. this sort of sideways motion horizontal motion when a lot of the other stuff is vertical and it makes that's it very move. cool it makes it move and it makes it fresh and new and flowing and um you borrow so liberally from so many styles but they come out as you i wanted to ask you in chicago there's a long history of acceptance for what we used to call the avant-garde mm -hmm. right with uh the old uh, aacm you're familiar with that i'm sure what oh was yeah that? Sure. association for the advancement of creative music was that what it was right i think so anthony braxton and the art ensemble of chicago exactly. uh, you I've get seen the, in my class wow i'm really impressed <laughs> sunrise right. sunrise and, sure. and i've seen and all I those acts uh, and yeah. and I, I've seen a lot of those acts live, and and uh, it's it's such a mix and uh, fresh. It's just how would you describe that as different from a bebop album or a fusion well, album? Just like hip hop, that's celebrating its fiftieth year. Uh, the AACM recently celebrated its 50th year, too, at the Chicago Jazz Festival. They had a lot of the AACM groups, and sort of how it started out, you know. You know, the lineage of jazz, that's why I said I don't even know what jazz is. I mean, if you think about right. early jazz, and then it goes you know, into swing, which was more entertainment, big band, but, you know, popular jazz, mm -hmm. then bebop, then hard mm -hmm. bop. And then, mm -hmm. you know, then it kind of broke off until, you know, you started having, um, you know, modal gospel like, fusion. Oh, uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and then after a while, you know, people were like, they were breaking the rules and saying, well, you know, what, what, we don't want to be tied down. So after a while, you know, free jazz slash avant-garde jazz came into play. And so a lot of that stuff was also played in lofts. I mean, even in uh, right. New York and everything. Mm -hmm. So that's 
part of what happened in Chicago. And you, and you had, like, I play with Muhal Richard Abrams. I play with, you know, Lester Bowie and all the, mm -hmm. you know, all those great musicians. And, and in fact, Anthony Braxton it, it, it was a graduate of Roosevelt University. A lot of people don't know that, you know? No, I didn't know so, and, yeah. So there's a lot of things where that kind of music is based on, on freedom, really. But mm -hmm. also... Really great players, and most of them are really great. I mean, they're they're very well grounded. I mean, if you listen to Don Moyer, I, I've done stuff with him too. You know, Don can play straight great ahead drummer. as good yeah. as any. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, so it's it's not just free because you can't play your instrument kind of free. It's right. basically free to like, okay, this is a new day, this is a new hour, new minute in my life. Let's just create as opposed to just kind of re, you know repeat things and, and blow, you know, blow scales that you've practiced over to make the changes and stuff right. you know well and i hear a lot, a lot of that in your in, in your music i hear a lot of that let's talk about yeah. your new your new recording right. so tell us about your new your new cd because it incorporates a lot of these things we've just been talking about mm -hmm. so about a year and a half ago mirko the, the vibe player he goes paul you know there's this great percussion ensemble called ichos percussion we'd love to have you play our quartet with them and just you know do some gigs i said of course you know anytime to come to italy i'm going to italy at the end you know it's last week in august so anyway so we go out there and i've got a three-week tour last year so most of it is with my piano trio with fabrizio and john marco so the, uh, like after let's see the third day we had about three days to do this album Okay. And I have no idea what this is going to be. I mean, really, literally, mm -hmm. I'm up I'm game for anything. So there were some gigs booked called the Alchimia Project featuring Paul Wordico and and these four, these four people and and this each chose percussion. So anyway, Jean Marco and I we drive up to northern Italy and we go where each chose percussion is this great warehouse. I mean, you walk in, it's this gigantic warehouse with all their percussion gear and everything it was pretty impressive. And there's they have a record there too. So I said, this is this is great. You know, let's we're gonna play. But the thing is they wanted to play in the round, okay, all in real time. Now one thing, one of the guys from Ichos was not there because he had COVID. So they had a sub. You know, and the engineer also had a cold too, so that was kind of interesting. Um, but anyway, so that first day out of three days, we set up because we got there, you know, mid afternoon, and I get my drum sound, everything sounds great, and we're going to try to play this tune that's like mixed meter and everything. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. wow, this is what happens when you record like that? If anyone makes a mistake, you know, then every, it's in everybody's mics. How is this ever going to happen? But what happened was. Once we started playing in my headphones, I'm hearing bruh, 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 bruh. I'm going, what the heck? It's the latency mm. from my microphone all the way, you know, 40, 50 feet into the timpani and the marimbas and mm. everything. How'd you so solve say, that? Yeah, how, we can't do this. We can't right. do this this way. Okay. Right. Now, at this, like, again, I don't know what's happening. All I know is I'm a guest artist in this each, uh, Alchemia project thing. So I said, okay, I'm taking over. We're gonna do we're gonna do bits and pieces, you know, where we can record. We're gonna do it all with click, okay. And then so we finally get one take done that first night, and it's really good. It sounds really good. They're all great players and really good musicians. Everyone speaks English and everything. Mm -hmm. So then we go out for dinner. Now the thing is, the engineer, who's a great engineer, he's a classical guitar player that does a lot of the records for uh, Da Vinci Classics. You know, he can only work eight hours a day, so during dinner time we were done so we only have two more days left so then that night you know it's it's like 105 degrees those days okay so i get to this hotel it's a great hotel fantastic and that night around 3 a.m i wake up and it's like 95 in my room so my air conditioning is not working so that's one thing that happens okay so the next day we're going to start recording at 9 a.m and we start layering things and we start, you know, I'm arranging things. I'm like adding parts or, you know, telling, you know, the guitar player is a different guitar player than was on the quartet record, Dynamics of Meditation. This guitar player is from London. His name's Alex Monk, killing, great guy, killing guitar player. So, you know, we're all kind of just making things up as we go along and we're making really good headway. So mm -hmm. by the end of that second day, you know, we've got like maybe 35, 40 minutes of music. And then all of a sudden they go, well, no, 
we need 60 minutes of music. <laughs> and I'm like, 60 minutes of music. We've got like a literally like a half a day left because we have to play a concert that next night. So I say, here's what we're going to do. Luckily, I had my computer with me and I had waveforms, you know, in iMusic. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I said, here, we're going to take five of my drum solos from three different records and you guys are going to improvise over those. I'll conduct and I'll tell you like, you know, and that's what we did. And they were all first takes. So, and yeah, luckily, you know, and just put them in Pro Tools. It was great. So now, not only do I have the original things on some of my records, which I thought were complete, but these guys added really cool colors. They, did, mm -hmm. they didn't clutter it. They just made it, you know, they gave it different um, harmonic ideas, different timbral ideas. You know, sometimes I would sure. say, okay, this piece, let's keep it metallic or this piece, let's keep mm -hmm. it wood. And then, so now, okay, we have like a half a day left. We're only, we're only you know, like, you know, 49 minutes. So the day before we went to dinner, they gave me their CD. He chose percussion. They gave me their CD and they had first, second and third construction by John Cage, I which I wasn't that. really right. at all. But I saw, I said, well, third construction, that's 11 minutes. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to play a brush solo up front, right. then just, just hit the thing and Pro Tools, you know, because we we put it from their their CD, and I played over it, no music all the way through, right? Like what they tape. did to your stuff, yeah. What I yeah, and the only thing they did, which I did to them, like the last note, I'm go, you know, right. like, okay, we're done. You well, know? that's a great bit but of producing was, and, and a good mix of yeah, what, you know, pre-record and and improvised stuff. Let's talk about yeah. your new your new recording. It's called Drums Without Boundaries. Mm -hmm. You could probably play the second tune, Black 2, if you want, because that we also did a version of that on that previous record with the quartet, but that okay. was much more acoustic, you know, uh, right. sound, jazz sounding. This one's got, you can hear how great this guitar player is. Well, I'm going to play some of this Black 2, everybody, so let's have a listen to that for a moment. Okay. <laughs> That, that's like I said, this one of the bass players, Jean Marco Scalia's tunes. And um, it's a really, really cool melody. And I'm basically playing again horizontal. Like I'm, it's all, it's with click, it's perfectly in time, but I'm doing my pacing, you know, and playing it, rubbing against it, going with it, pushing it, pulling it back, but always, you know, with forward motion. Very cool. Very cool. So, uh, you know, you're also teaching at Roosevelt. Where do you teach? So I teach at Chicago College of Performing Arts at Roosevelt University. It's right downtown. It's right across the streets from Buckingham Fountain, Michigan Avenue. 
Okay. And uh, I've been there. I'm, I start. Well, it's funny. I get home from Italy on the 26th, and I start teaching on the 28th of August. And this will be my 21st year. Wow. So that's a real gig with uh, tenure and well, all that stuff. I'm te- yeah, I'm tenured and everything. I love it. You know? Excellent, man. It's, that's a great way to go. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it was really great. And, you know, w- when the COVID happened, I was able to teach all my classes remote, which I really loved, you know. So it really got us through that, too, because obviously gigs were invisible at right. that time, unless you did studio work where you just fly things in. But um but anyway, yeah. So I love teaching, and I've got some. I got, I've got some killing students, man. I mean, you know. So the future looks pretty bright for music, at least from the musical side. Business side will you know, remains to be seen. How you know what happens with everything. That's a good point. Things. Nobody knows where this is going, but we do know there are some wonderful young kids coming up who can play their butts off, and they yeah, know and the they styles play, and the they, history, and they're for real. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and it's not just that they're technically more adept than we were probably when we were in college but they they're just real musical and they have like so many different influences you know i mean since i was in college you know so you know we didn't have hip or rap you know rap at that time world music was sort of there but not really you know, it was just coming groups. on yeah. and we were still fighting right. the fusion wars so to speak you know if, right uh, <laughs> well i would feel we should start start to in. happen when i was yeah. in college yeah, yeah. And uh, so they have so much to draw on, and and it's it's really hip what they're doing. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this: There's a tendency when you play improv improvisational music that's straight eighth in mm-hmm. nature to uh, sort of devolve into backbeats. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, it can. When we talk about wrote, swing, when yeah. we talk about jazz, we don't play ding yeah. dack a ding dack and like chopping wood unless you really call for right. it. Uh, on right. a general consensus, if you're comping behind somebody in a combo, you're not going to play two and four on the snare drum. Right. right? And in in uh, instrumental exploratory music, there's a tendency in eighth note music to sort of rely on that. How do you avoid that? Well, the way I explain it, I mean, because one of the combos, you know, when I was head of jazz, I did that for five years. I made our combo genre specific. So we have an ECM combo. And the way okay. I explain it to the drummer, is that it's like like bebop, except mm-hmm. you're evening evening it out. Mm-hmm. So so basically That's what I was all those kind of, yeah. So all those kind of Jim Chapin exercises, you know, you just kind of like, you know, you're you're copying. So you're you're dialoguing, playing melodic ideas between your bass drum and snare, for instance. Mm-hmm. But you're doing it in an even eighth note pulse. So, so it, it makes a lot of sense. And a lot of times when someone's having a problem, like, you know, not at our school, but just, you know, say generally if I'm teaching private lessons, which I do, you know, if someone's having a hard time thinking, I'll say, okay, play a rock beat, like, okay, so now in your eighth notes are ding, 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 okay, so now go ding, ching, ding, ching, ding, ching, ding, and put your hi hat on the off beats, ding, ching, ding, ching, ding, ching, ding, boom. All of a sudden, now they're playing like a bebop thing with a bebop thing. With eighth notes. So the eighth notes become quarter, the eighth notes become quarter notes. And let's not forget that when you play eighth notes fast enough in a bop field, they're straight. Yeah, they. Yeah, they even out. Exactly. They're straight anyway, right? Ding, 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 ding. Those are straight. Absolutely. And, you know, people phrase things differently. You know, if you look at how, you know, in the day it was a dotted 8 16th. Well, you know, bebop players, a lot of them played more like that. But Elvin Jones, it was more triplet kind of based, you know, so stuff kind of swung in a more sort of smooth way as opposed to that up and down kind of way. And, you know, if even in Chapin's book, he talks about some drummers that would play like dot, dotted, what was a dotted, oh my God, not well, a dotted eight, six, eight, it was like a dot, with a dotted 32nd, like dot, right. da, 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 dot, da, da, dot, da, dot, dot, yeah, da, so you had people da, like that, mm-hmm. two things. And then with my book, you know, Turn the Beat Around, which is the only book ever written about playing backbeats on, on one and three, I call them front beats. That's actually made a big difference too. That's part of the reason I mentioned this. I know you covered this turf. So tell me about that. Well, because because 
Okay, so the, you know a lot of people think about the two and four, and even a lot of times in jazz they go, oh, you know, always think of the two and four. Have the click on two and four. Well, not really. I mean, that's one thing. But if you play with, and you're thinking in four, like if you're tapping your foot, da 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 da, da, da it's going to sound stiff. Where if you got to know the one, which is the whole note, and then the one and three, which is the half notes. Mm -hmm. So when you play a backbeat uh, as a front beat, it makes you more aware of those things so mm. when you go and you play a backbeat a regular backbeat you're more aware of of where the one and three is okay so now to get back to the swing thing if you really want to flow you don't think one two three four you might think one two three four go one two two ba, ka, da, ba, two. instead da, ba, ka, da, da, ka, da, ka, da. see mm -hmm. so, so so if you phrase and you know where that one is you can move around with the subdivisions you can breathe you have longer you have longer ways to kind of point to forward motion that's the same thing with inorganic versus organic playing so inorganic playing is all subdivisions 16 triplets you know quintuplets organic playing is where you play from point a to point b and that could be wherever whatever length you wanted but you can you can it's hard in there. You can do whatever you want to do, but you don't change the tempo because the tempo is still there. Point A and point B are still in tempo. And so that's a very interesting play, way to look at it. Like flurries, it cool? maybe flurries or clusters, or I'm thinking of oh, uh, yeah. Coltrane's, uh, you know, stacking chords kind of a thing where he's not really playing yeah. 16ths or eights. It's blah, 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 blah. Yeah, there's like uh -huh. there's like groupings of seventeen and that that Coltrane would play. Destinations I mean, start yeah. at a destination point, and these are all opening up the dialogue from traditional bop phrases. But up that bop, patoo bop, It's not it's not that, but it's and that opens the door to the uh, the free stuff too, doesn't it? Yeah, and then if you do put in the bebop stuff, it's it's more like. Ah, you know, so like, you know, you play with tension and release. So, you know, you're playing against the grain. You're like, ah, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you go, bang, boom, chan, goodbye. Audience goes, ah, you mm -hmm. know. So it's like shifting to another gear. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Now we're going here. Boom. Yeah. Very cool. There so you, you with you started exploring this stuff with Matheny. How, how no, open was he to all of that? I've been, I, when I was in high school, I got my first drum set. I had a radio, an AM radio, like right behind me, like sort of where these Grammys would be. And I would play, you know, AM radio, like WLS or WCFL were the two Chicago stations. And they'd play the Hollies or the Kinks or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I would play along with those, but I would play free and, but kit, get the kicks. So I've been doing that. I have no idea why I do this. I think it's because I've always been drawn to the melody first i mean even in when i was the percussion leader in high school i didn't want to play snare drum as the leader i wanted to play bass drum and cymbal to augment the music to make it swell mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. dance so i had and and no one taught me this you know i'm self-taught on the drum set really so yeah so, so maybe so that's why just, you were able to bridge these gaps they didn't appear to you as gaps in the first place right it just Nobody options. told you you couldn't do it. It was wrong or it wasn't stylistically appropriate. You just kind of melded them all together, whether it's straight right. eighth, and whether I, it's swing, whether it's improvisational, whether it's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. serves the song in a pop sort of mentality, or whatever it is, you just, uh, it, it starts in your head, right? I mean, you heard it that way. That's why you well, played I it. I bought that tons way. of records. You know, I bought right. rock records, jazz records, ethnic records, mm -hmm. classic records. So I listened to everything, you know, and just kind of put it together. Something, if something spoke to me, you know, it kind of went in my pot, you know, as an ingredient. And like my band director, like Donald Ehrensberger, who I dedicated my book to, he was my high school band director. I had a great, great school band director, Vern Pate, too. But Donald Ehrensberger let me do all this stuff. I mean, you know, he would let me improvise on a written symphony. Go, I like what you're mm -hmm. doing more than what's written, you know. Mm -hmm. So like if I yeah. had a teacher that let me be me because you know sometimes teachers are just like you got to do it this way they don't right. want to think or be the well the great the great teacher ed <laughs> self told me he said uh, i don't teach drums i teach improvisation there you go that's it when i was in the high school drums. because i could improvise on the snare drum like the choral director would bring me up we're going to do the battle hymn of the republic or something mark will bring a snare drum and i just make shit up and it was the ability to improvise that he liked and we never knew what was going to happen. So it's certain a mindset that has to be open to that. 
and and, yeah, and a fearlessness. It's, just, it's like a muscle, like your fearlessness. It's like a muscle that just gets you know if you don't use it, you you know. So that, that's why, like when I teach my students, a lot of times I have them like I'm already have my even my improvisation course doesn't start with just like playing you know rhythm changes. I, it's you know it's about like the blues. And so you know like a a blue 12 bar blues you know jazz musicians sometimes go oh that's just three chords no i mean it's getting into the mm. sound it's getting into the, the dance sure. and everything sure yeah know? and then i would teach mobile stuff too instead of teaching about about like running scales over chord changes which they're going to get in music theory anyway like come up with a melody you know if you have one or two chords like you have to come up with a melody you can't just play a scale to make the, the next and, and that's, that's so coming. much harder to do you know oh. i look at something like oh. phil woods solo on just the way you are he didn't run changes man he played another melody he and created another that. melody yeah and, and to me that's infinitely that. more creative and difficult than to run changes though that's got its own set of challenges too and yeah. in well, our and we we interpret it the way you're talking about it you know we're not really blowing over changes but we you're trying to avoid the normal cliche phrasing but we are blowing over the changes see you know right. that's the thing i mean because that's the that's the reason a good song is probably good as opposed to a song that just you go like the chords just kind of go but they, they don't they don't resolve there's no forward movement and resolution mm -hmm. so as a drummer if you're aware of the harmonic rhythm that's when you can dance around create all this stuff and then nail something down the mm -hmm. road you know as opposed to just keeping right. time and just tension and release supported. yeah yeah well this is great man this, this, this is what i was looking for for me because I, I i really wanted to hone in on that aspect of your playing that incorporates these styles so effortlessly and isn't afraid to move into the free world thanks and you know it, it's like i play so much music i you know i don't even know what it is i mean you know it just I just start playing and react to it you know yeah it's it, it's just you know it's a talent i guess but it's also something that i i've just done and I, I that's why i'm never bored i'm never running out of ideas you know it's just like the music just is fresh all the time and then you just play over it you know and well, then you that's play from your creative music. spirit is fresh all the time it's you that's fresh all the time and and uh whether you're an educator you have great books out you teach at a university you have stu a body of students out there that are playing uh you gigging in all kinds of of styles you got grammys behind you man you're somebody who's really put it together and uh has quite a career to look back on that's still still active still going thanks you got to be proud well, of that i thank you you know i turned 70 in in january and i'm in the best shape ever you know i, I do hundreds of push-ups 100 crunches every day and you know it just keeps me fresh and it makes the drums easier too you know mm -hmm. i mean when you're still like your body is like tweaked as opposed to like if mm -hmm. you get older and you work out everything kind of gets sure. floppy and uh, well some of our friends of i were talking last week there's no old man drumming you know you can be an no. old man and drum but you can't drum like an old man <laughs> <laughs> right, you know? right. It's got to be fresh and energetic and on the mark and bing, bing, bing. Now, I mean, you notice you're wearing, a, is that a dream t-shirt? Yeah. I just yeah. talked to Andy Morris at, in Nashville last weekend. He's the uh, president of Dream, as you know. Those are beautiful symbols, and you're a symbol guy, I know. Uh, you kind of came, re, re, repopularized the flat ride with your work with Matheny. That was everybody who referenced prior to that the uh, Roy Haynes, now he sings, now he's up, Chick Korea, Peisty Flat Ride. But um, talk about flat rides. Well, it's funny because I, the first time I, I bought a flat ride was I heard now he sings, now he sobs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's funny because, you know, that was on solid state and that LP does not have who's I'm pl playing bass and drums on that record. In fact, I had a, with my college professor, I had an argument because he said it was Jack D. Jeanette. And I said, mm -hmm. no, it's Roy Haynes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I asked, actually asked Miris Levitas when I saw him, was it Jack or was it Roy? He goes, no, it was Roy, of course. Yeah. So, but when I bought that record, the next day I went down to Frank's drum shop and I got a flat ride. Really? Now, unfortunately, they didn't have a Peisty. They had a Zildjian, and it wasn't. It was okay. It wasn't wasn't the, the best one. But mm -hmm. through the years, I bought different ones. And then once I, you know, 
I've always played Paiste too back when I was a kid because I had a lovely drum set. Th those two were, you know, they were kind of you get one, you get the other. Good but match. um no, and and the and the flat rides, the thing with Matheny that was so good is that you know the music's very organized. It's 90% of it's with sequencers. There's a lot of parts moving on, and he plays a lot of notes. So if you have a washy, like sort of K, which, you know, I love Ks too. I mean, they sound great, all symbols, but it's got to match the music. The flat right. rides didn't get the way, you know, mm -hmm. they had mm -hmm. the, kept, um, the rhythm and you could bash the hell out of them, but they never build up to be kind of a roar, which, mm -hmm. which was really one of the nice things. Now, some, I know some, some people don't like that actually, you know, like some of the, the jazz musicians in Chicago, some of the older black jazz musicians, they wanted more of a wash, you know, that's right. why they call it a ride. They're riding on it. So they didn't want the ting, ting, a ting. They wanted just wah, 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 wah kind of thing. But flat rides are definitely, it's my thing. And it works with the way I play mm -hmm. because, you know, when I play, uh, I sent you that, that, um, the sound painter, um, article interview mm -hmm. in that's drummer that David, right. uh, Bar David, Slow did. It's a great talk about yeah. Me. yeah, and I mean, you know, so because strokes, if you play up and down, it's sort of like the same thing as playing like one, two, three, four. You get the same sound, which is great if you're looking for the same sound. But if you go to the right, you go to the left, mm -hmm. you get, you know, the pitch goes up or the pitch goes down. So on a flat ride, you can really get all that articulation by the way you dance on it. Where sometimes mm -hmm. if you're playing a wash or cymbal, some of that stuff kind of has a tendency to, it's there, but it kind of has a tendency right. to disappear. The one thing about the dream symbols, which I love, is that they're really, they kind of give, you know. How does it catch the stick, you. right? How does the symbol yeah. catch the stick? That And is it a soft, and, buttery feel? Is it hard? Is it, you know, you're a symbol guy, you know this stuff. And I, I like the yeah. way you pointed out that in Matheny's band, with all that layering and texture in the middle, you didn't need a lot of stuff in there from drums. You needed some uh, something higher, something above right. that, to, 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 to not get in the way of that and be able to, yeah, it's also the frequency too. You know, like right. the, you know, like if you have a mid rangey symbol that's kind of taking up a lot of mid frequencies when you have keyboards and synths and everything, it's right. going to wash not only the rhythm out, but it's going to wash sort of the color and and, and the sonics of the frequency mm -hmm. out too. So you find a, the flat rides that had a, a beautiful, nice range of undertones and overtones. Right. And it was like you just dance on them. Now, what was Pat's take on all this? Did he just say that's up to you and didn't didn't discuss it, or was it something you guys? Well, talked no, I mean about? we discuss. I mean, whenever I got like new symbols, you know, you know, like say Paiste would send me some new symbols to try out because I cracked, you know, I cracked probably twelve symbols every tour. You know, it looks mm -hmm. like I was playing soft, but I was hitting really hard. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, and I was using the Paul Wertico drumsticks, the eight hundred eights that Promark they've stopped making them, which is really a bummer for me. Um, but that was part of the sound because if you use a lighter stick, you don't get so much of the undertone that you want to. So on right. a flat ride, my my signature stick got like a beautiful range. But we would go through the symbols too, because sometimes, you know, you get a symbol back in the day where Pat would go, wow, that's there's this weird frequency sound. Sounds like a telephone ringing or something, mm -hmm. you know? So we go, okay, that symbol, that symbol's out, right. you know? So we would find symbols that would work. Right. For sometimes that, singers will find those pitches too. A singer will go, oh, mm, no, that can't, that pitch comes out. I can't deal with it. And it could be even just a certain <laughs> song in a certain key, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, there's a lot to deal with here. Sure. It's Paul Wertico's Drums Without Boundaries. Now, you gave me several places where I can hear it. And yeah. one of the things I want to ask you about, ask you about is one of the places I can see it is on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? Because this is a for-profit industry. <laughs> you know i know and everybody well, can I mean, go to youtube for free i know that's 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 one of the things about killing you know yeah it's like that's one of the big di di differences though like when you have a cd you know now a good cd player's got great d to a converters and stuff like i mean even if you put a wave in your computer your your computer has you know decent mm -hmm. uh, d to a converter it's not gonna be the same when i put my cd of my new record on it's like you're right there. Now, if I listen to YouTube, which I did recently, I, I put this my CD through the same speakers, and then I, I I played through television through those speakers. YouTube, 
it inverted some of the dynamics some stuff really? that was supposed to jump out at you actually kind of got pushed back Really? So the difference is when you're listening to MP3s, not only the compression, but it changes all that magic that you know you do in mastering to really make people feel the music. I didn't and that's that. the difference. So it's free, you know, and so it, it affects you know it affects. But it's a lesser quality it. that uh, that you're oh, getting. Oh my god! And so yeah. so kids don't know that though. See, kids. That have was no my idea. next question. If kids don't know that and they're going for the free, the free, the free, the free. It makes it difficult to keep doing this, right? Uh, totally difficult. Yeah. And then so, you know, there was just something today that I saw where, you know, they had the different rates of um, residuals for, you know, Tidal, Spotify, Apple. And, you know, they're all like zero, you know, point zero, zero point zero whatever. point something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I love YouTube because to teach is great. So like if I'm teaching a, a jazz history class, I can pull up, you know, let's look at a Billie Holiday. Yeah. Here's that's, Sonny you know, Payne. That's Yo, there he that's is. Fantastic. Yeah. But, but, but with this, where, where people do it, I, I understand the convenience and I understand that, you know, quantity, you can, you know, MP3 is going to take up way less than a waveform. Right. You know, there's flax, you know, like you can't play flack on an apple, for instance. Flacks are great too, but they're not quite mm -hmm. as good as a, as a wave. But the thing is also like your system. So if you, in the old days, if you had a little CD Walkman, okay, it sounded fine to play the CD, but it doesn't sound the same as like a good CD player, right. you know, because right. it, it it's like, man, you're, you're paying for something that's needs to you know it's all the wiring it, it's it's all the the attention to detail of what is going to make the sound the sound as opposed to just yeah it's just the sound let's just blow it on out yeah and so and that's, i think it depends on the kind of music you're listening to you know oh yeah if, if you um, want to listen to heavy metal, which i love you know Pat, well, you if, say, if oh, you're you if you're at the beach you know yeah hanging under the umbrella it doesn't really matter <laughs> you know right. but if then you're you trying annoy, to then you can annoy your neighbors you know with your <laughs> you know because at the beach i want to hear i want to hear the water i don't want to hear someone playing yeah. you know, well that was just TV. an example no i know what you mean i know but you know what i'm saying it's like yeah. that that's the other thing what the, the point is it's not always critical listening sometimes it's just for fun it's just in the yeah. background doesn't really matter yeah. otherwise times you want to put the cans on the buds whatever you got that you spent a fortune on listen on a great system great stuff and you hear all those things and i just hope everybody realizes that they're not getting that when they check out an album on youtube it should be something right. like yes i dig this i'll buy it yeah well that's the way it used to be you know i mean that, you know it used to be like that. and that's why people would tour too you know you tour to sell the records sell the right. lp Right. Or sell the CD because people would go to the concert either they bought it already and want to see you do it live, or they'd see it live mm -hmm. and go, "Wow, I love this music! I'm going to go buy the LP tomorrow." You know. Now, when you so, tour, are you selling LPs? Are you selling downloads? Or well, it depends. So, Word of Cocaine Gray, our eighth record, which I should talk about too, it's called uh, Windows of Time. We just made CDs, but we also made LPs. And and a couple of the records, like the John Hellowell project, uh, Paul Worko, John Hellowell, the live in Bari session, that we we did LPs of that as well. Wow, that's and great. so it just depends if the record label wants to right. spend that money. But well, I didn't mean yeah, necessarily I mean, I, LP oh, versus CD. I meant CD versus download code. Well, it makes it really hard though, because you know, like when I tour, I usually don't even. I just bring a carry on, so you know, right. I'm not going to bring a box. Right. stuff i mean that's another convenient thing you know mm -hmm. i mean the old days a box of lps weighed a ton they were this sure. big then yeah. a box of 40 cds was this big but mm -hmm. you have a couple of those that weighs a ton now and you have so, a card you know a little here it is well Here's no your... we used to do that 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 used to be but but i don't even know how, how we can do that now too you know so there, there's okay. advantages and disadvantages to everything but the thing is is to really you know if you're really going to enjoy what the, the artists had in mind to the closest that you can get it you really need to listen on a good sound system to mm -hmm. you know to mm -hmm. a good even a good turntable because you mm -hmm. know if you if you're spending 24 dollars for an lp that used to cost three dollars and then you've got like i've seen these these turntables that sell for 150 bucks that's not going to get all the information that's in the grooves right. because you know the stylus a lot of times styluses are a thousand bucks or something. You can't afford that all the time, but that's going to pick up more information than mm -hmm. 
that's amplified. A lot of people buy a big amplification and then they're amplifying they're just crap. amplifying the shitty signal. Yeah. You can't yeah, do that either. Yeah. So right. yeah. Well, that's so you, gotta, you gotta you gotta get the blocks in in order to get yeah. to get not only that, it's better more supportive to the artist. I mean, you guys do better when they buy a CD, right? Oh God, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And especially on tour, you know, because on tour, if we if we do have them, you can sign them. Sure. You yeah. know. You know that that's that's the greatest thing too and a little and income helps book. to facilitate the tour yeah well you have books too it's on alfred music it's, it's called um you know it's called turn the beat around that came out in 2017 a lot of people and that's the only book ever written about that subject you know mm -hmm. out of all the thousands of books i i wrote to joel rothman who i'm a big fan i've always been buying his books since the you know the mm -hmm. seven 1970s when I went to Frank Drum Shop. Me and too. He yeah. loved. It. He goes, oh man, I wish I would have thought of that. You know. Well, he's written what 150 books or something. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I so. use I've used books. I've I mean, used it was too, really. Yeah. I, I started buying them in the yeah. 70s, like you did. Yeah. I still have those too. You know. Yeah. All right, Paul Wordico, educator, entrepreneur, producer, um, recording artist, composer, band leader, drummer. Let's not forget. And husband and father. And I was, I was just going to get to that husband, father, good guy. Cause in the um, end of the, in the end of it, that's what we want to be more than anything else. Right. Absolutely. I'd rather be remembered absolutely. as a, as a good husband and a good father and, and a, and a good friend. That's right. All right. Well, okay. Paul's got them all going on and you can catch everything about him and more at paulwertico.com. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, say thank, thank you. you for spending your time with me today. I know you have something to get to, and I promise you, you would make it on time. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I've got I got three minutes before my next thing. That's perfect. <laughs> well, that's close thank enough. <laughs> All right, brother. We'll, we'll talk soon. Thank Paul Wardico, everyone. Take care. Okay. Sure. Bye.